Hi, my name is Jerry Hesch. I'm a physical therapist and a manual therapist. Uh, I do joint treatment and I utilize a technique that I've developed over 30 years called the Hesch Method. And um, this is my course workbook. It's a 200 page workbook that accompanies a workshop that I teach. And I also have a distance learning and advanced videos. But I'm here to talk about the torsion chapter in Eric Dalton's book. And I'm really excited about that book. It's quite an honor to be able to present on that book. Sacral torsions have confused many therapists for many, many years and many clinicians as well. And it certainly confused me for a very, very long time. And it's a complex movement of the sacrum about an oblique axis that involves rotation, a little bit of flexed extension, and side bending as well. It certainly involves the lumbosacral junction as well, involving the L5-S1 facets and even most likely the four or five facets as well. It's a very complex movement and it involves muscle spasm and guarding and the actual motion in the SI joint as we know is very slight um, but nonetheless motion going through that structure does get blocked and it's pretty difficult to visualize the movement that occurs over the uh, right and the left because the upper part starts on the left oblique axes. Um, the language is very confusing and in this chapter I make the language much simpler to utilize and understand, and the language predicts the treatment. I also simplify the treatment technique because it can be treated very simply. And I utilize emotion testing, which I call springing with awareness. It's a little bit different than spring testing because spring testing is a thrust, where springing with awareness is taking up the slack in the joint structure, imparting a specific amount of force, and perceiving the recoil. You can repeat it a couple of times, um, and there's a final recoil. And it's certainly easy to visualize a child's toy, uh, this being a block, a child's lettered block, wood block. It's easy to visualize that, the front face, and also in three-dimensional space, and it moving about an oblique axis. But the sacrum is a little bit more confusing. So in that chapter, I really simplify that concept. And I've done research over the last 15 years. Every time I teach a workshop, I survey the therapist and find out how much exposure they've had. They've all had what one would think to be adequate exposure, but they don't understand sacral torsions enough to evaluate and treat them. And there's lots of research to, to discourage treatment of the SI joint, and there's a lot of research to encourage treatment. And so I think the model needs to be reevaluated, and I've taken um, uh, some effort in doing that in that book chapter. On the skeleton, I'm pressing around the trochanter and then using the femur to press up against those attachments and release them from the inside. Okay, once again on Lori, it looks like this. All around those rotators, trochanters. D, we're doing all these up with the leg up in the same position. D, I come under her uh, lower and upper leg, get a hold of her rib cage, helps sometimes the kneel, get down. I'm going to roll the rib cage toward me, and then lift the leg slightly to get a counter twist. Rehabilitation of the locomotor system is something that I was introduced to uh, by Dr. Carol Levitt. Uh, studying with Dr. Carol Levitt and Professor Vladimir Yanda from Prague introduced me to a new paradigm of treatment of the locomotor system. Today we're seeing a uh, coalescence of different ideas from people like Gray Cook, Gary Gray, Professor Stuart McGill, and many, many, many others. What we're seeing is that everybody is starting to get on the same side of the ball. Basically, in a nutshell, the rehabilitation of the motor system begins with a functional assessment. It's the process and the principles of functional assessment, of finding each person's weak link, and then finding a solution, finding a way to regroove a motor pattern so that we can have a stepping stone to broader activity and tolerance.
we've seen the fuzz. You can see it now. I'll put it in over my voice. The fuzz yields to my fingertip. Sometimes I come across a stronger, thicker strand that doesn't yield to my fingertip. That represents older fuzz sometimes, or maybe it represents a nerve. But each night when you go to sleep, the interfaces between your muscles grow fuzz, potentially. And in the morning when you wake up and you stretch, the fuzz melts. We melt the fuzz. That stiff feeling you have is the solidifying of your tissues. The sliding surfaces aren't sliding anymore. There's fuzz growing in between them. You need to stretch. Every cat in the world gets up in the morning and it stretches its body and it melts the fuzz in the same way that the fuzz melted when I pass my finger through it. When you're moving, it's as if you're passing your finger through the fuzz, just like I did on the cadaver form here. So you have to stretch and move and use your body in order to melt that fuzz that's building up between the sliding surfaces of your musculature. The sliding surface, those shiny white surfaces of the rectus femoris sliding against the vastus intermedialis. So these uh, sliding surfaces are all over your body and the fuzz is all over your body. And as you move, you melt the fuzz. Now what happens if you get an injury? Aha! My shoulder! My shoulder is stiff now. I'm holding my shoulder. I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. I don't stretch my shoulder. I'm afraid it hurts. So I'm walking around like this. Last night's fuzz doesn't get melted. I go to bed. I sleep some more. Now I have two nights fuzz built up. Now two nights fuzz is more fuzz than one night's fuzz. What if I have a week's fuzz or a month's fuzz? Now those fuzz fibers start lining up and intertwining and intertwangling and all of a sudden you have thicker fibers forming. You start to have an inhibition of the potential for movement there. It's no longer simply a matter of going, oh, ah, stretch. Now you need some work. Now you might need to do a more systematic exploration of that place to restore the original movement that you lost. And usually this is the case. We have a temporary injury, then we restore our movement. But sometimes we call this aging. The buildup of fuzz amongst the sliding surfaces of our bodies so that our motion becomes limited, the limit cycles become introduced into our normal full range of motion, and we start to walk around like this. We're all fuzzed over. Our body is literally solidifying. We're reducing our range of motion in, in individual areas of our body and you know, for our entire body in general. So I believe that one of the great benefits of body work, whether it be massage or structural therapies or uh, physical therapy or any kind of hands-on therapy, uh, these types of therapies introduce movement manually to tissues that have become fuzzed over through lack of movement, whether the lack of movement is because of an injury and a person is protecting that injury or because of uh, personality expression. That was many years when I just walked around like this, so I was very still and monk-like. So, and then I became a little more dynamic in my personality when I realized what I was doing to myself and the kind of life that I wanted. So, you can grow fuzz by choice or by accident or whatever, and yet here, now you've heard the fuzz speech, you know that you can take responsibility for melting the fuzz, and if there's too much fuzz in your body and it's frozen up, you might want to seek help in order to introduce movement so that the new cycle is a little more movement and a little more movement and a little more movement instead of a little less movement, a little less movement, a little less movement. Different people will have stress in their upper hamstring or their lower hamstring. It depends what kind of activity they're doing. Somebody that's working um, on an elliptical stair climber may have a lot of tension in the upper hamstring as it contracts to bring that hip back. Somebody that's bicycling may have more strain on their lower hamstring. So another thing you can do is actually bend the leg so that we have a little bit of relaxation of the lower hamstring which will enable you to sink in. I'm using my thumbs here, you could also use your knuckles or your fingers and you feel where strain patterns are. Dina has a lot more strain on her medial hamstring than her lateral so I'm actually going to take my thumbs and not worry so much about this lateral aspect and move to the inside and anchor that and just see how does this knee when it straightens, how does it work? 
Does it work as a straight-on hinge, or are there a lot of rotational forces? If I feel my hands pulling one way or another, then I'm going to counter that strain so that this knee will work in a straight way. This is, again, the same type of thing that your clients will notice a difference when they've never had their hamstrings worked on this way. Bicyclists love this work. So all I'm doing is softening that muscle, anchoring, and then stretching. If I want to work on the belly of the muscle in a stretched position, I just need to step back, tell Dina to keep her knee relatively straight, and then with a long lever arm, just work with my fist. Hi, I'm Tom Myers, and I'm pleased to welcome you to this DVD on the anatomy trains, myofascial meridians. The anatomy trains is a map of how the muscles connect through the fascial fabric of the body. In this way, it's similar to kinetic chains. It's also somewhat similar to the meridians in acupuncture, in oriental medicine. But this is based on Western anatomy, and it's based on the direction of the fascial fabric of the body. The fascial fabric is what used to be called sinews. It's the sheets and strings and threads of the white, gristly stuff that holds us together. It gives the muscles its shape and attaches them to the bones. Although the fascia goes all over the body, through the organs and the brain and everywhere else, we're going to focus on the direction of this fabric through the muscles. Golfing is an unnatural act, as Serge Grokovetsky says. The spinal biomechanics of golfing, even if you're a great golfer, is not good. If you're a bad golfer, it's horrifying uh, because of the way the spine has to twist. So particularly if you're 40 or older, when your spine is not quite as resilient. Anyway, notice the direction I'm coming. I'm going toward her belly button. And I'm slowly sinking in, and right now I'm just using her respiration. When she takes a big breath, I resist. And she doesn't take, I, I'm not telling her to breathe, but when she takes a breath, I resist. And when she exhales, I keep taking up the slack and moving straight toward her belly button, sinking through because you've got to get way down in there to affect quadratus. Once I feel like I'm down there far enough, I'm going to ask you to pull up on the therapy table gently. Pull on up a little more. Perfect and I can feel it come right through there and relax and wiggle your feet that right foot wiggle that right foot can you feel that coming through there yeah. yes. that's a good one that's a good enhancer that's coming all the way up through the, through the uh, stirrup spring system and into these uh, these muscles that laterally flex the spine when we walk that uh, fire and wind up that uh, rotary torque in the um, spinal engine If you change that paradigm slightly and you let the body just ever so slightly move from being aligned over the posterior third over the ankle into lining up with the whole foot and letting the legs be slightly, the stance be slightly open, what that does is allows the body to be receiving the forces of gravity coming through it and the earth pushing back in the opposite direction that recreates this recycling of gravity and its counterforce, ground reaction. So it's very, very dynamic. And uh, as soon as people learn this idea, they take this into the holding patterns and they change those in their yoga and in their Pilates and in their exercise and in their running, etc., etc. It becomes very, very fun.
Hello, my name is Robert Schleib and I speak to you from Munich, Germany on the other side of this planet and it is my pleasure to report to you some of the most recent research findings concerning the nature of fascia and particularly as it relates to our work as body workers who work with our hands touching the human body. learn how to train your facial body such that it becomes better tonified, more injury resistant, more flexible and more fun to live in. The exercises consist of facial release, roll very slowly from the outside of your hip along and downwards to your right knee. You make slow and gradual changes as well as apply downward pressure. Fly facial stretch. Pay attention to your feet as you move. With every step, feel your heel come off the ground. This sideways motion will load your fascia even more intensely. Rebound elasticity. Invent your own creative jumps. Simply be bouncy. You can as well play with a full body turn and bounce back to the wall. See if you can keep an elastic full body tension in your body as you play with the variations. Be prepared that when experimenting, with the fashion movement shown here, that this will most likely trigger a great sense of fun. Enjoy! Oh, oh, because I have a back problem, and, and I consulted the seven uh, 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 orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons, and <clears throat> I got seven diagnoses. And so I thought, uh, if you bring your car to a mechanics, he give you a diagnosis, then you bring your car to another mechanics and give you a different diagnosis, then maybe the mechanics is not really competent. <laughs> And uh, if I have seven different diagnoses with all kind of different treatments, four recommended surgery, three did not, I thought the best course of action was to do nothing and to head straight to the library and try to understand what was the problem. If you study the gait of people with no lower extremities, and this is one specimen, and I can show you here that his pelvis demonstrate that the legs are in fact two floating bones unconnected to the pelvis of the ground. So this gentleman is standing on his isha. Now, the logic dictates that if <coughs> the legs were necessary for a human locomotion, then this person should not be able to walk. There is no way around it. So let's have a look of how he does it. You see, if you, if you hide the bottom of the screen, you cannot tell that this man has no legs. You cannot tell this man has no legs. There is no adaptation. This is the way we move, and the legs amplify the pelvic motion. Now, the conclusion is that locomotion was first achieved by the motion of the spine. And the leg came after as an improvement, but not as a substitute. And that requires a rethinking of the diagnosis and the treatment of spinal dysfunction. Because if the spine is an engine and not a bridge linking shoulder to pelvis, then you will have to reinterpret the signs and symptoms of a spine injured patient.
So what I do is I do a one-legged flexion stretch. So she gets up on one leg and then she just bends down and, and you notice that she's going right to this. Now we're going to know that we're going to be treating uh, lateral tracking of the patella and we're going to be treating patellar tendinosis. And we're just going to hook into the superficial fascia. And I'm intending to release the quad so that I can take the pressure off the patella and thus off the patellar ligament. So as I hook into the superficial fascia, um, I want to make sure when I get into the rectus femoris of the quadriceps that I'm ironing out the entire quadricep group, that I'm taking it all the way up to its attachment on the ilium because in addition to affecting the knee, it's actually going to flex the ilium, part of that lower cross syndrome. The other thing is I just want to hook that fascia and draw it back down this way. So what I'm doing now is I'm, I'm compressing the muscle, but I'm doing a compressive stroke that unloads the patellar ligament and the patella. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of unload the patella and then I'm going to go in and I'm going to friction the patellar ligament. I start in one direction and I like to get real deep in there. Deep doesn't have to mean painful if you go slow. So I'm going to start the friction around the, the infrapatella itself. I'm going to come into the, I can feel a little bit still in and around that meniscus. I'm going to come down into that, that patellar ligament and I'm going to soften the collagen around the patellar ligament. Now by now you should remember what creates realignment of scar tissue and it's not deep cross fiber friction and ice. What creates realignment of scar tissue is the movement that follows in the eccentric, pain-free eccentric forces that follow that. The movement has to be pain-free for the eccentric forces to be applied because everything has to stay pain-free. So Fran's gonna bend her knee and extend her knee three times. And so that's active. And if that's pain-free, she's giving me permission to eccentrically load that. Then Fran's gonna straighten her knee, and I'm going to take two fingers, and she's going to let me bend her knee, but she's going to load it. Now, these forces are drawing the collagen, or what some people refer to as scar tissue, into alignment with the healthy structures. And if Fran does her self-care exercises, this won't come back. Remember, the adductor magnus fires by compressing the exercise ball, and then Fran goes into flexion to about 30 degrees, and then she comes into full extension, so I want to lock those knees out, and I want to keep that upper body straight. So slowly go down, slow. Again, what we're doing is we're strengthening the vastus medialis to prevent lateral tracking of the patella, reducing the contribution of patellar tendinosis, chondromalacia, patellofemoral syndrome. So again, she comes down really slow. That's realigning the scar tissue and the patellar ligament. That's eccentrically loading the VMO, the oblique fibers of the vastus medialis. And I just sit back and I watch, and I make sure she's doing that correctly. Does that feel okay for you? I'm Aaron Mattis, the developer of Active Isolated Stretching, or also called AIS. It is a therapeutic exercise technique that has evolved over the last 40 years and is used all over the world both to train athletes and to treat people suffering from injuries, muscle overuse, chronic pain, or neurological conditions. It is interactive, gentle, and very effective. Active isolated stretching and strengthening is different than most any other stretching that you know about. We don't hold our stretches for a long time. Instead, each stretch is performed for about two seconds and then repeated. This approach yields rapid results because a two second stretch allows the muscles to optimally lengthen without triggering the protective stretch reflex. When you hold a stretch longer, you can restrict blood flow, decreasing the amount of oxygen and nutrition.